my goal is to really give everybody in the audience something that you can take away. I know this is a really diverse group, so we have parents, we have uh, teachers, we have psychologists and pediatricians. So I really hope that this can give everybody in the room just a little bit something to take home that can help either you, your children, um, or anyone in the community around you. So um, as Robin said, I'm gonna talk about ADHD today and I'm gonna focus on two different kind of uh, topics. The first one is the clinical guidelines that were put forth by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And these are guidelines that are supposed to be used by all um, pediatricians when seeing a patient that they may have concerns about ADHD. Some people in this room may think, well, why do I care about the guidelines for pediatricians? I'm not a pediatrician. The reason that I think it's extremely important for everybody to understand these guidelines is because you are the people who advocate for the kids. And there are a lot of pediatricians who don't follow these guidelines, but if you know what your child is supposed to have done or you recommend to a parent, hey, you know, I heard this is what's supposed to happen, then you're much more likely to get um, the children the services that they need. So that's why I'm hoping um, that everyone can take uh, some information away from this. The second piece is really just some different resources that I've found. Most of them are things that I've utilized mainly for my personal life, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second um, and, and kind of what pushed me into this general direction. So my objectives today, I'll just go through them really quickly, really to talk about some of the evidence-based treatment options for children with ADHD, as well as what we should be doing to evaluate these kids, to emphasize the importance of long-term follow-up for um, patients with ADHD, and then finally to talk about those resources. So a little bit about myself. Um, like Robin said, before I came to the mind and focused on working with kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities and disorders, I was a general pediatrician at Kaiser. I was for several years, and I had a young child. And when my son was five and went to kindergarten, he started to have a lot of difficulties. And his teacher said, he's fine, he's distractible, don't worry about it. But as his kindergarten year went by, my son started to refuse to go to school. He cried, he kicked, he screamed, which was very unlike him. When I went to his parents' night at school, I said, show me all your work. You know, there's 10 projects around and all the little kids, you know, cute art projects are there. And as we walked around, I realized that my son was the only child who really didn't finish any of them. Uh, every single project, even though they were fun, they were coloring, they were tissue paper art and all these things, he hadn't finished any of them. Uh, and I, I talked to his teacher and she said, it's okay, he's really smart, he's doing fine, don't worry about it, he's gonna do great, he'll figure it out. And as the months went by after that, my son started to say he was stupid, he was too dumb to go to school, and said he should stay home because he wasn't capable of learning like the other kids. And I can imagine there's a lot of you out here who know what that feeling is like to see your child struggle like that, and it was completely and utterly devastating to me to see a five-year-old say that he was stupid. So at that point, I realized I really had to do something to help him. And I got him diagnosed, and he was diagnosed with ADHD, and I got him some supports and help. But at the same time, as, as I, was a, I was a pediatrician, I had no idea what to do with him at home. I didn't know how to manage his behaviors. I didn't know how, really how to help him at school. And I went, well, if all these pediatricians were managing these kids, we're giving them medication, we're trying to help them, but we don't know what to tell people practically on a regular day-to-day -day basis. And so I really wanted to make sure that I became educated in that, but it also drove me to do more formal education in what I'm doing now. So a lot of the stuff um, from this presentation is gonna be from my own learning. My son is now 10 and doing awesome, and he's a lot of fun, and he's totally fantastic. So uh, he did really well, but he just did need some help. So a little bit of background about ADHD in general. My hope is that everyone in here does know what ADHD is, but ADHD is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and it is a disorder that's been around for a very long time, so it is not new, although you will hear people say, well, that's just a new disease, or that's a new problem in the United States. That's not everywhere, but that is definitely not true. It's seen everywhere, and it's a chronic disorder, so people with ADHD have symptoms for a very long time may not be the same type of symptoms, but even adults who have ADHD tend to have some difficulties. So it's important to keep in mind it's there forever. It is also um, a disorder that can present in very different ways. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we need to look for in these children. So as I said, ADHD is not a new disorder. So in the 1700s, there was actually a Scottish physician who described ADHD in this lovely 
article, which is The Nature and Origin of Mental Derangement. But, <laughs> so not necessarily the most rosy of, of um, you know, talks, but the, the reason that I put it in here is it because it very classically described kids with ADHD. And this was in the 1700s, so obviously this isn't a new problem. Then in the 1800s, there was a very amusing German psychiatrist who started talking about, um, he actually wrote these stories. And the first one was the story of Fidgety Philip. I don't know if many of you have read this, but it's actually a poem and it talks about this young boy who is extremely hyperactive, tends to be in, the kind of accident prone, very impulsive and gets himself into trouble. He actually also wrote an additional poem that was called Johnny Look in the Air. And as you can imagine, that was his version of the inattentive child who wasn't paying attention. So it was in the 1800s, it was really distinct enough for somebody to actually write poems that very classically describe what we see even nowadays. It was finally in 1968 that the DSM-2, which the Diagnostic um, Statistical uh, Manual for Mental Disorders, for those of you who don't know, is really kind of like the Bible of um, diagnosing mental disorders for those of you who don't do, um, who aren't aware of it. But it's something that physicians use, psychologists use, psychiatrists use really to make diagnoses that are these behavioral diagnoses. So we're not getting a blood test to look. This is really telling us what behaviors um, we use to diagnose these uh, conditions. And so this particular was the first time that they were, it was really described, and it was actually described as hyperkinetic um, kind of reaction. So it was kids who were overly active. It wasn't called ADD at that time, but that'll come in a little bit later. In this late 60s, actually, Ritalin, or methylphenidate, became recommended treatment for actually not children with ADD, because it didn't actually exist at that time. But it was recommended for kids with behavioral problems. And again, a lot of those behavioral problems were ADHD-based um, behaviors. And then finally, um, in 1980, the DSM-3 came out with calling it ADD. Um, and it was ADD with or without hyperactivity. And that, from that point forward, it's really been referred to as ADD. Although more recently, we have changed from using the term ADD, and it's now everything is called ADHD. So whether your child or an adult has hyperactivity, we still call it ADHD. And so sometimes that can be a little confusing to parents because they're like, well, my child isn't hyperactive, and they said I have ADD. Why are you saying that I have ADHD? Everybody has ADHD, it's just a different type. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few seconds. So just so that everybody knows, it, it kind of helps clarify everybody's got ADHD. It's not ADD anymore. In the 80s, there were a lot of studies that actually looked at twins, and it was determined that ADHD was not a product of bad parenting or, or, or issues in the environment completely. There was a lot of genetics backing ADHD. So what we knew is, yes, there is something in the environment that, that adds to it, but really there's a lot of the genetics that goes into it. So we aren't blaming people or saying this is bad or you're, you're not doing this correctly, you're not parenting correctly. Really, we know there's a lot that goes into it that we can't control. But there's some things that we can control, which is the, the good part. And then finally in the, in the, in the 2000s, um, the CDC recognized that ADHD was on the rise. Um, ADHD causes a lot of issues for um, the people that are affected by it, and they actually did declare that it was a serious public health problem. So that's kind of a big deal because it put forth a lot more research um, and a lot more kind of um, uh, attention on ADHD as a whole. So that brings us to where are we at with ADHD today. In the world, about 5% of the population has ADHD. It goes through all countries all cultures, all races, all religions, it is everywhere. So it is not just a disorder of a specific population. We can see it anywhere. In the United States, it's estimated that the prevalence can be anywhere between 5 to 10 percent. There are some estimates that it's as high as 11 percent. In California, it's about 7.3 percent. So we're kind of smack dab in the middle in California. As I said a few minutes ago, it's a combination of genetics and environment that causes ADHD. So there isn't one cause of ADHD. It's a lot of different things going together. It's the genetic predisposition, so something in our genes causes us to have that propensity to have ADHD, but there's also a lot in the environment that adds to it and layers on top of it until you end up with the actual um, disorder. There are several risk factors for ADHD. A couple of them, I'm not gonna go into detail, but a couple of them are prematurity, alcohol, and um, tobacco exposure in utero, lead exposure, and there's a lot of other stuff that, you know, there's a lot of research that's going on we don't really know otherwise, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes into it. And then finally, I'm gonna talk really briefly about ADHD presentations so that you guys are kind of aware of what we call it, because ADHD has changed in names for a long time. So ADHD, every patient who qualifies as having ADHD has ADHD, but they end up getting labeled with either 
um, a type of, um, either it's primarily inattentive, primarily um, hyperactive and uh, impulsive or combined. So it's, 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 it's said that way as a presentation because we know it changes a lot over time. So if you say you have ADD and you have ADHD, well maybe in a year you guys flip your symptoms so what do we call you now? So that's why we call everybody ADHD and then we break it off into presentations. So at this time, this is the symptoms that you have. So I'm gonna talk about the American Academy of Pediatrics Clinical Guidelines. And these are guidelines that were really worked hard by a lot of different people. And it was over two years of meetings with several different groups. So it wasn't only the American Academy of Pediatrics, it was the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the Society for Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics, the Society of Pediatric Psychology, National Association of School Psychologists, and there are several others. So all of these groups got together over two year period, looked at a lot of evidence, studies, did extensive research to say what can we officially recommend for all the pediatricians? What do we think is really necessary to be done for these kids? So these are the two papers that came out of those meetings. They're actually from 2011, so they're a little outdated, and I'll talk about that as well. Hopefully it'll be um, updated in the next year or two. But uh, this is kind of what came out of it. So these are all the practice guidelines. I'm not gonna have you read them, I'm just saying these are the six, they came up with six guidelines and I'm gonna go through each of them and kind of explain what they all mean. But before I go over those, I wanna talk about how we look at these guidelines when we start um, deciding how to present them and which ones are recommended because I think this is a good way for anybody who's looking at treatment for any child regardless of what it's for um, to really think about whether you want to do that or not. So the first thing is to look at the evidence and if you look um, there's A through D evidence and basically that just means A means it had really good evidence, really well done studies and a lot of evidence. Gets a little bit lower and lower down to D which means there might be some evidence but there isn't a whole lot. But that's not the only thing we take into consideration when we're deciding whether to make a recommendation or not. We also wanna think about whether there's a, a likelihood of benefit versus harm. So you wanna say, well, maybe this, this particular treatment has really good evidence that it may work, but it also has really, really bad side effects. Well, that really plays a lot into what we're thinking. So our goal is to find the things that have the most benefit, the least risk of harm, and have good evidence as well. So that's kind of the two pieces that we look at. And when you're looking at treatment for your own children or for yourself, this is really how you should look at it too. So the first guideline I think is complete common sense, um, but there are a few points to think about. So it says that the primary care provider should initiate an evaluation for ADHD in any four to 18 year old with academic or behavioral difficulties and symptoms of ADHD. So really if you have a patient who may have symptoms and is having difficulties, start an evaluation. I think that makes complete sense and everyone here is like, duh, of course that's the case. And of course the evidence, there's pretty good evidence and it's a strong recommendation. But what I wanna point out is that you also have to think about all the other things that can come up with a recommendation like this. So obviously you wanna think about the positives. When you make a recommendation like this, a lot more kids are gonna be really well evaluated and a lot more kids are gonna be diagnosed with ADHD, which is fantastic. On the negative side though, if people are really aggressive in screening and testing, we may have kids that, diagnose, get, that get diagnosed that shouldn't be. So you have to keep that in mind. That being said, in the end, we know that because there's so many kids with ADHD, there's a lot of effects that that can have long term, we definitely wanna treat them. But I like people to think about the possible positives and negatives, because it's not just about side effects. It could be cost, it could be your time. Maybe if you spend a lot of time doing this type of an intervention that isn't really beneficial, Maybe that's a harm because you could have been doing something that would be more beneficial to your child. So it's just a different way of looking at things. So what does this evaluation or assessment really need? Obviously a physical exam and a history. So your doctor should see you, should talk about the symptoms, should do a physical exam and make sure there's nothing else going on. That's kind of a given. But a few other things that you really need to think about when you're doing an assessment is a developmental history. So think about when that person, when that, when that child was a baby, did they have normal walking and talking? That makes sense. But in addition, what was the interaction between the parent and the child like? What type of a baby? What was the temperament of the baby? Were they a really difficult child? And how did the parent interact with that? Because that can have really big effects on how a child develops and, and how they react and interact with the environment. Sleep history is massively important and I think this is one that unfortunately I think a lot of people forget to ask about and forget to really uh, address in detail. Sleep problems, when you're sleep deprived, you cannot look like you have ADHD. You can test, you can do the, the forms and it'll look like you have ADHD, but you may not. If you have a sleep disorder that's causing you to be dysregulated and have difficulty with those issues, you don't actually have ADHD. You have a sleep disorder that needs to be addressed. 
So if your child snores a lot, wakes up a lot at night, can't fall asleep, you go in the room and your kid is kicking around and wiggling all over the place, those are problems and they need to be addressed and you need to think about whether those just may be, okay, they're just associated with ADHD too, or is that really what's the core cause of your child's symptoms? Family history is important. Of course, you want to ask about a history of ADHD because as we just talked about, it tends to run in families, but also a family history of other d disorders like uh, developmental delays, autism, learning uh, difficulties, school difficulties, things like that, because all those uh, tend to be interrelated. Social history is one that, again, I think sometimes busy physicians forget about, um, but social history, history is extremely important because when you look at a child who's had a traumatic event or has been abused, very frequently they can look like they have ADHD. And it may not be that they truly have ADHD, it's all the trauma that they've experienced can actually make it look that way. Uh, in addition, it's also important to just see how ch children relate uh, with their families because sometimes different parenting styles, if your parenting style doesn't really mesh well with your child's style, sometimes that can also cause behavioral um, difficulties and increase ADHD symptoms as well. So those are all the things that really the doctor should be asking about, but if the doctor doesn't and you recognize that some of these things may be coming up, it's really important to bring that up uh, to a physician. The behavioral rating scales are, I think most of the people in this room, if you've ever had a child evaluated for ADHD or done an ADHD evaluation, I think everybody's probably filled out a behavior rating scale. There's a ton of them, and I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail here, but it is really important to get behavioral rating scales, both when, both when you first diagnose a child, but also, for follow-up, and I think I very frequently have parents who go, these stupid forms are driving me nuts, I hate filling these out. But they really give us a lot of really valuable information as to how the child's doing over time. So I may be able to say, you know, we aren't sure if things are getting better, but look, if we look at the scores from the first one to six months later, there's a lot of improvement, or maybe we think they're doing better, and really they aren't doing as well as we think they are. So it really helps us to know where the child is at and if we need to change things. So they are extremely important. The last piece that I'm going to talk about with assessment is the fact that psychoeducational and neuropsychological testing is not necessary to diagnose ADHD. So you don't need all the extra testing and the in-depth testing. That being said, you should always keep it in the back of your mind because we know that kids with ADHD are more likely to have learning disabilities and learning um, differences. So it's really important to keep those in mind. So there are a few times when I do recommend that psychoeducational testing and neuropsychological testing be completed. One of them would be as if you have concerns about um, the intellectual level of the child. So if you're worried they may have um, an, an intellectual um, problem, if you're worried that they may just be a little bit more delayed than you would expect, I think it's important to address that and determine their cognitive abilities. The other um, time would be if you have a child who has a lot of difficulty in math or reading that really is out of proportion to where you would expect them to be able to function. So let's say this is a child who really is very smart and doing well, but they're failing math and that's the only thing they're having difficulty with. Well, it's really important to address if that child actually has a specific learning uh, disorder or learning disability. So another time um, when that testing, additional more in-depth testing would be recommended. And then the last time is if you have a child with ADHD and is getting treated and you're doing everything the way that you're supposed to, but things just don't seem to be getting better, another time when you may wanna consider doing a lot more in-depth testing. So the second piece is that the primary care physician should use the DSM, that Diagnostic um, Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, to uh, that criteria, utilizing reports from several sources and to rule out alternative causes. So again, this really does seem like common sense, but the big focus is that the doctors should really be using this criteria. And the reason it's important to use the DSM criteria is that it means that everybody is looking at things in the same way. So that if you have a psychologist, they're looking at the same way as the pediatrician and everyone has the same understanding of where they're, where they're starting and where the diagnosis comes from. So again, this has pretty good evidence and it's a strong recommendation. So these are the actual um, beginning half of the DSM-5 criteria and I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth about these, but I do wanna talk about a few things that changed. When these guidelines first came out, it was the DSM-4 that was, um, was utilized. Now we have the DSM-5, so although these particular guidelines don't, haven't been updated, we now recommend using the DSM-5, which makes sense because it's the most up-to-date version. A couple of things changed with the DSM-5. So one of them is that because we know ADHD is an ongoing condition, these, the kids should have symptoms at a young age. It doesn't mean they have to be diagnosed at a young age. 
In the DSM-4, it was recommended that the kids must have symptoms before the um, age of seven years old. In the DSM-5, it's actually before 12. So let's say you have a, a teenager that comes in. As long as they had some symptoms before 12, it can still be considered ADHD. And that takes some teasing out, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but what that means is it's really important to ask a history and, and ask what was going on with the child when they were younger. And again, like I said, they don't have to be diagnosed at a young age. They just have to have had symptoms at that time if you look back at the history. So when we look at the DSM-5, these are the symptoms of inattention um, that we look at. So there's nine of them that are listed. And if you have six of the nine of these symptoms, then you basically qualify as having inattentive uh, presentation of ADHD. Some of these, I mean, I think most of you guys have pro can probably guess, but they don't seem to listen when they're spoken to directly, are really forgetful, um, really distracted. So um, a lot of these are, are pretty common. The second section is the hyperactivity and impulsivity uh, symptoms. And again, these are clustered into a set of nine symptoms. And again, it's six of the nine symptoms for children. Uh, it's actually five of the nine for adults. Uh, but for kids, it's six of the nine symptoms. And again, you know, for hyperactivity, it's they fidget a lot, can't sit in their seat, talk excessively, uh, seem like they're driven by a motor. And then the impulsivity ones are kind of like they blurt out answers before the question's done or they can't wait their turn. Uh, so these are all um, kind of the symptoms that we typically look at. And again, it's six of the nine of those. If you have six of nine in both of them, then the child has combined ADHD. So a few things to think about when you're using the DSM criteria. When you see preschool-aged kids, so these are supposed to be used for kids between 4 and 18. Obviously, preschoolers at 4 or 5 have a fairly different developmental level than older kids. So you need to keep that in mind. The base criteria, all those questions, can still be used to diagnose it. But what they found is that the actual um, presentation or subtype, so whether they're combined or impulsive or inattentive, those are really not reliable because in that age group, they kind of have a lot of different symptoms that kind of mosh together. So although you can say yes, they have it or no, you really can't be sure on which presentation they have and that tends to change anyway over time. It can also be hard in preschoolers just if they aren't in preschool, if they're actually at home, you may not have multiple observers and one of the things with ADHD is they have to have symptoms in multiple situations. So it has to be at home versus school or even extracurricular activities. So if there's other environments the child is in, then it's easier to diagnose. Unfortunately, if they're only in one environment, it's very difficult um, to diagnose at that age. And then in adolescence, it can also be really challenging because if you think about adolescents, they tend to change um, classrooms really often. So if you ask for a teacher report, they have a teacher who may see them an hour a day. Well, an hour a day is really hard to get a good idea of what symptoms a child has. So sometimes it's recommended that you get multiple teachers. If a child's in a sport, you can talk to the, um, you know, the coach. You can talk to extracurricular activity um, people. So pretty much anyone that interacts with them for a decent amount of time is, so sometimes you may need to get multiple kind of reports from a lot of different people to get a good idea of how they're doing. The other thing is parents have less opportunity to see their teenagers on a regular basis because they tend to be out and about um, and doing things. So again, the diagnosis of ADHD in adolescents can actually be a much uh, bigger challenge and it's definitely something you need to be very careful with. So evaluate for comorbidities, including emotional, behavioral, and physical, and that's number three. Well, again, duh. You wanna think about all the other things that can go with ADHD when you're looking um, at evaluating a child for it. But again, very frequently, a lot of these questions are missed. So again, this is a strong recommendation. We really need to think about what other things could be going on with kids. And again, the same positive and positives and negatives, we wanna catch all those things and treat them appropriately, but we don't wanna overdiagnose kids or diagnose them improperly, so it's important to take your time. So these are just a few of the conditions that we really need to think about when we see patients with ADHD or possible ADHD. Um, so learning disorders and learning disabilities, we know that they are much more common um, in kids with ADHD. So it's important to think about that. And like I said, if you have a kid who has a really kind of off profile and has you know, one specific subject that's much worse than another, whereas a lot of, those are the times when you really wanna think about the learning um, disorders. And they may require additional testing. Language disorders, including language delays, um, pragmatic difficulties, and also um, like stuttering can be more common in kids with ADHD, so it's just things to th keep in mind. Disruptive behaviors, which a lot of times are put into the category of like oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder, much more common in kids with ADHD. Um, and in fact, if you look, about a quarter of kids with um, ADHD also have oppositional defiant disorder. So it's important to keep those things in mind. Anxiety. About a quarter of kids with ADHD have anxiety and about half of adults with, AD, with ADHD have anxiety. So there is a lot of anxiety in this population. Whether this is hardwired in or whether this is a kind of a from the environment that they're in is really unknown. But the fact is, is 
when you think about a child with ADHD, we know that kids with ADHD tend to get yelled at, reprimanded, told what to do. Um, much at a much higher rate than kids who don't have ADHD. And if you think about being in an environment where you're constantly worried you're gonna get yelled at, that's kind of likely you're gonna develop anxiety because of that environment. So it's really important to think about that in an early age and really work with parents and explain to them how their ADHD affects them and what things you can do to help them. Mood disorders, depression, bipolar disorder is uh, more common. Tick disorders, um, so for those of you who don't know what tick disorders are, um, Tourette syndrome is the one that's classically described, but really it's just um, abnormal movements or um, vocal vocalizations. It can be um, really the, page, the person doesn't have control over it, they just feel like they have to do these movements, and that is a lot more common in kids with ADHD. Seizures. Seizures um, can actually mimic ADHD, so there is a particular type of seizure, absent seizures, and they can actually, sometimes people will think that a child has ADHD when they really have absent seizures. So it's important to really get a good, um, good history of that. And if you have a child who literally stares off into space and when you touch them, you can't wake them up or they're still staring off into space despite the fact that you're in their face, that would be a big red flag that something else may be going on and you want to talk to your doctor about that. Developmental coordination disorder is also very common in kids with ADHD, and I think a lot of people see, oh well, yeah, I have my kid with ADHD, and they tend to be kind of klutzy, they trip a lot, or they have a really hard time with handwriting, and really it's just that these kids have a difficulty getting the, sun, the signal in their brain properly out to the muscles to do what they want them to do. So it's very common for kids with ADHD to have that coordination difficulty. And then again, sleep disorders, which I already talked about, so it's really important, again, to address the sleep disorders. Some special circumstances when you think about comorbidities or other things that are related to ADHD is substance abuse. So in teenagers, it's extremely important to do a good screening, really ask a lot of questions about substance abuse. And the recommendation is that if, is that if you find a child or a, teen, a teenager with substance abuse, that child should always have the substance abuse addressed before t treating the ADHD. Um, and there's several reasons for that, but one of them is that these medications have, a lot of the medications that we use have the propensity for abuse, so we definitely don't want to don't want to kind of put that in, in the hands of somebody who's already struggling with abuse. Um, but we also know that the treatments just don't work as well in general until the um, addiction is addressed. So it's really important to think about that and address that right away. In any practitioner who's considering treating a child with, an, uh, with, an, with some addiction, if you're not going to address the addiction first, then you should really have a specialist um, consider treating because it's something that is um, probably out of the realm of a normal uh, pediatrician, a typical pediatrician. So the fourth is one of the ones that I think is probably the most important takeaway from this particular um, article, uh, is that this guideline says that we need to recognize ADHD as a chronic condition and utilize a medical home model. So I think that in the medical community as a whole, for a very long time, ADHD has been like, oh, they have ADHD, here's the medications, go, you'll be fine. And then you'll outgrow it and everything will be good. We know that isn't the case. We know that not only do these kids struggle with a lot of difficulties, even when they're well treated, they can still have a lot of struggles, which can affect their self-esteem. Um, and cause a lot of other difficulties in the future. But very frequently, because we know that ADHD is, a, is partially genetic, oftentimes the parents have a lot of difficulty with either being diagnosed with ADHD or just having some of those symptoms. And in my family, it's that case. My son has ADHD, and guess what? My husband has ADHD too. So it's one of those things that, from personal experience, I know it's extremely important to give good support because if my husband on his own had to manage my son's ADHD, I can tell you it probably wouldn't happen. Um, so it is really important to think about it and really support these families. So in the medical home model, we really want comprehensive care. We want these people to come in and get everything they need. We want to do a whole person approach. So you need to address all of the issues that are coming up um, with these patients. And they should be follow followed on a regular basis with a pediatrician that is the same person so they know them well. Uh, and I think that's something that hopefully over time we'll get better and better at in the medical community, but it's definitely uh, something that we're lacking right now. So again, it's got really good evidence. All chronic disorders should be managed in this way. So again, some of the positives of doing um, this kind of medical home model is that you get coordinated services. You get social workers and nurses and a lot of people who can support this family and help them navigate the system to get what they need. The negatives, which has, I think, traditionally been a problem when you're trying to start these clinics, is money. And so when you have multiple people getting together and coordinating services, it costs more money. That being said, in the long run, it's likely that in the end it saves money because we know that the amount of money you put in at the beginning typically comes back to you 
at a greater cost later because if you can get people um, functioning better at a younger age, then they do better overall in the long run. So treatment varies based on age. And so this is one that I'm going to focus on a little bit more. And it's because it's extremely important and we're doing a horrible job of this. So I'm going to start off with preschool uh, age children. So the kids that are four to five, the recommendation first and foremost is an evidence-based parent or teacher administered behavior therapy. It is not medication. Not that medication is not okay to use in this age group, it just shouldn't be our first line. So all five, four and five year olds really should be getting a behavioral treatment before you start them on medication, unless they have really severe symptoms or you're already doing a behavioral therapy that just isn't helping and you need to add medications. Um, and so I always like to point this out because I will tell you that as a whole, um, pediatricians were not doing a good job of it. So this is actually one of the really nice uh, graphics that the CDC puts out and I really love it because a parent and pediatricians, everybody can understand it. But unfortunately where we are right now is that only one in two kids with ADHD actually get behavioral therapy. So we're half of what we should be. All kids should be getting behavioral therapy at this age and only half of them really are. Uh, and so it's important as a parent, it's important as a teacher, it's important as a therapist to say, oh, well, your, your pediatrician is recommending medication. Well, have you tried something behaviorally first? Um, because if we don't push it, the pediatricians will probably fall back on, well, I know medication well, this is what I've been trained really well to do, so that's what I'm gonna do. Elementary and school-aged kids, so that's considered six to 11-year-olds. Uh, again, so this, the recommendation is to do an FDA-approved medication, which has really good evidence, and also evidence-based behavioral uh, treatment. So in this elementary school age, you want to actually do both. So those kids should be getting behavioral therapy just like the little ones should, but they can also, um, you can also start with medications right away too. And, and a lot of the, there's a lot going into that, but part of it is that, you know, that is an age group when you really need them to keep up, you really want them to learn everything they need to learn. And if you wait six months and a year of school before you really decide whether or not that behavioral treatment is working, they may have missed a lot in that time frame. So to do both at once to try to really get them caught up quickly. Obviously we know that behavioral therapy and medications work uh, the negatives are, again, the increased costs, and it takes more time. So behavioral therapies, everybody has to have a buy-in. The parents have to really spend that time and understand what's going on, or you know, the teachers have to spend that extra time to really work with them. So there's a lot of, of pieces that go into that, and then medications have the potential for side effects. So those are kind of the negatives that can come up. But really, when you think about it, the benefits that you can gain from this is very much outweighs the risks. So for adolescents, 12 to 18-year-olds, it's a little bit different. So for adolescents, FDA-approved medications for ADHD actually have very good evidence. So it's important to give teenagers uh, medications as long as you've ruled out some of the other comorbidities. You can prescribe behavioral therapy, but in this case, the, actually the quality of evidence isn't there. So for adolescents, we just don't have a lot of research on behavioral um, interventions for adolescents with ADHD. And so unfortunately, we can't say, yeah, you have to do this in all of them. It's likely it may benefit them but we just can't guarantee that and we don't have really good research. So do I think behavioral therapy is a good idea for a lot of adolescents? Absolutely, especially if they have comorbidities, but it's not a necessity really. The medications are the piece that has the highest uh, amount of research. And the same positives and negatives. So again, this is the second graphic, again, the CDC just for the other age group saying, hey, these kids should really be getting both, um, but most kids are really typically only getting medication. So what can we provide for evidence-based behavioral treatments? I'm going to go through a few of these, and these are the ones that have actually been looked at in ADHD, so that people have a little better idea of what we have available. So behavioral parent training is really what has definitely been shown to um, have benefits for families um, and the kids' symptoms. So it improves compliance in children with ADHD. So we know that a lot of times kids with ADHD have a hard time following instructions and doing what they need to do. These trainings have been shown to improve compliance. They also improve parent understanding of what's going on with their child. So I, I will tell you from personal experience, I've heard parents say, my child is evil. Um, my child is purposely always doing these horrible, obnoxious things. And to get a parent to understand that that is not your child doing that on purpose. That is your child not being able to regulate themselves. And so when you punish a child for something they can't control, that doesn't work well. So really teaching parents how to manage their children and the behaviors that their children um, exhibit is extremely important. So these therapies work really well for that. And then finally, 
interestingly, high levels of parent satisfaction. So parents really like these interventions. They like understanding their kids. They like to be able to go home and go, that's not my kid being horrible. That's my kid not being able to put the brakes on when something's going on and just can't control it. So they want to understand their kids and they want to help their kids. So that's one of the big reasons it works well. So behavioral classroom management, again, this is in schools. So these are all different behavioral um, plans that teachers can implement or um, special education instructors can implement. But they have been shown to improve the attention to the actual instruction, improve compliance with classroom rules, decrease the disruptive behaviors that kids with ADHD frequently um, can exhibit, and also improves their work productivity. So we know that both of these things are beneficial to kids. A few of the specific um, training, so when you look at behavioral parent training, it really just focuses on educating parents, not only about ADHD in a whole, so what does it mean, what are some of the behaviors that your child has, um, what do those mean, but also what behavioral strategies can you as a parent use to help your child. So they're typically over many sessions and they cover a lot of different topics associated with ADHD. We have an ADHD behavioral parent group, which is fantastic at the Mind Institute. It's a 12-week 12, 12 course. Six weeks is really just educating you about ADHD in general, and the last six weeks are really focused on how do you do behavioral interventions. And I think we need more of these <laughs> programs. I think a lot of people, if you've ever tried to find ADHD um, parent training, there's not a lot of them, and the ones that are there are usually fairly short, so you may not be able to get as much as you'd like. Uh, but if we can get more of these going, I think you know, we can make a huge impact on parents. And I've been, I've been through these classes, and even from my own standpoint, it was extremely beneficial just to understand that, number one, you're not alone. There's other parents who are dealing with this. My kid is, oh, they do the same thing. It's really a nice community to build, but also to just get a better, um, better understanding of what's going on. There are also several types of therapy that work really well for kids with ADHD. So PCIT has been used for a lot of different behaviors and a lot of different situations, but it has been looked at in um, kids with ADHD. Typically, it's used for kids from two to seven years old, and it basically just teaches parents positive reinforcement and how to play with their kids in a positive way. And it sounds like, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but in these kids, it makes a huge impact. It is uh, essentially, you, the parent goes in and they're watched and monitored and they're kind of told what, what skills they should work on. It's nice because it's very data driven. So I have a lot of families who were like, well, how do I know this is getting better? Well, it's nice because it actually, we, we keep track of it. So it's a really nice um, way to tell parents they're getting better. It's also nice because it's driven by how the parents are doing. So this isn't like, this is a, this week long, you know, this is six weeks, when you're done, you're done. It doesn't work that way. It actually looks at how the parent is progressing and when they get to a level Level of, of kind of competence and the skills that they're teaching, then they, they progress. So I think it works really well for a lot of families. Um, so if you're able to get it, I think it's a great option for younger kids with ADHD. Um, positive parenting program or triple P is another one that's really frequently used, again, zero to eight years old. Similar, it just gives parents tools and strategies to really build on their relationship and help it be a positive one with their children. The nice thing about this is there's a lot of ways of using this program. You can, there's actually an online version. You can get it from therapists. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So if you say, well, I can't find a therapist who will provide it, there is the option to do an online course, which may not necessarily be as good, but it's something um, when, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of resources. Incredible Years is another program that can be used up to 12 years old, and I actually think they have an older version as well. Uh, and again, it just teaches kids kind of emotional regulation, social skills, um, and helps them kind of understand how to decrease their aggression and help uh, decrease emotional issues. The nice thing about Incredible Years is it's a great program, but it can be taught by a lot of different people. So you, there are programs for parents, but there's also programs for teachers, um, programs for the actual kids, and it's typically taught in small groups, which again helps build a, kind of a community. So I really love that program as well. Cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavior, if you will notice, up until now, I haven't had any ages past 12, unfortunately. Cognitive behavioral therapy has not really been studied in, in children with ADHD. That being said, it's been looked at in adults with ADHD and has shown benefits. Um, and it has also been looked at in kids for other reasons. So although we don't have any really good evidence-based behavioral therapy for adolescents, this is typically the one that we'll go with because Unfortunately, we don't have any really good um, other, other programs. But it does um, help basically the, t the kids be more aware of their thought process. When they think about something, how does that affect their behavior? And it can really help those adolescents kind of rein in their emotions, understand their emotions, and get them um, kind of those aggression, those behavioral issues under control. 
There's also at the bottom, I just mentioned really quickly, there is some evidence um, early also for mindfulness, so mindfulness meditation for treating ADHD as well. Not a ton of, um, of research, it's more in adults, but again, it's something to think about. Mindfulness meditation is really easy to do. It tends to be calming, so it's something that you can do at home that may be helpful, it may not. But again, when you're thinking about the benefit-harm ratio, it's unlikely to harm anyone. So medications. When we look at medications for all age groups, if you, look, if you think about any of the age groups that I just talked about, medication recommendations are pretty much the same to start off with stimulants. So stimulants are anything, Concerta, methylphenidate, Ritalin, Adderall. Um, so all of those, all those medications are in the stimulant category, and those are our first and foremost line of treatment. And the reason that we choose them is, number one, they've been around for a long time. Um, they are the oldest ones that we've got but they're also shown to be much more efficacious. So they work better than all the other options. And we know that from a lot of studies. If you either have a child who can't use a stimulant or doesn't respond well to stimulants, there are other options, non-stimulants, um, and those are actually um, also in the recommended group of medications. So Stratera or Atomoxetine is one of them. Extended release Guanfacine, um, which is in Tunev and then extended release clonidine, um, which is cat bay, which a lot of people have heard of as well. And these are the ones that are most commonly used. These medications are, in actuality, the only ones that are FDA approved for kids with ADHD. All the other medications that we use are off-label. That being said, sometimes we need to use them, but these medications really should be the first line, and that's what doctors should go to first. So again, there's actually really good evidence on medications in ADHD. The last one is to titrate medication doses for maximum benefit with minimal side effects. Again, this sounds like a total duh. Okay, so you want to get the most benefit without side effects. Of course we do. So what we know about the medication, and some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about next is just from um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Practice Parameters, which are more, goal, um, more geared towards psychiatrists, but there's a lot of good points in there. And one of the things um, they, that they do address much better than, uh, than us is the importance of really monitoring these kids carefully. If you look at studies that took into consideration children on just medication in the community versus kids who are on a very strict um, follow-up schedule and um, titration schedule, the kids who are very closely monitored and medications are adjusted regularly do much better. Because if you watch those symptoms and pay close attention and adjust the medications when they need them, they're going to do much better. Unfortunately, in the community, what tends to happen is because pediatricians are really busy and don't have a lot of extra time, what tends to happen is you see them, you're like, oh, they're doing pretty good. OK, I'll see you in a year. And that's not the way we need to be doing it. Unfortunately, the AAP didn't really address follow-up in these guidelines, and the hope is that in the future they will. But ACAP did address it in their practice parameters. And they recommended that when you start a medication, you should be following up every two to three weeks after starting a new medication and after every dose adjustment. So every time you adjust that dose, you should be following up to say, is this working? Is it working as well as we want it to? Should we be changing it? And once you get stable, you should be seen at least uh, twice a year. So at least every six months to say, is this still working? Is there anything new coming up? Is anything changing? And then the other recommendation that they, they give, which I have a feeling may be really difficult for pediatricians to hear or anyone else who sees a lot of patients, is to reevaluate three to four weeks after school starts. Um, that may be a huge uh, burden of patients coming into a pediatrics office, but it's really important because kids every year when they go to school change. The demands may change, the children may grow, the children's symptoms may change. So when they start school, it's important to see them about a month after starting school so they can get situated at school and figure out if anything needs to change. And I think that is one that I don't know anyone who actually really follows that, and I think it just has to do with time management. But I think as a parent, you have that ability to say, hey, I want to be seen. And the teacher, yep. Yep, and teachers change every year too. So, All right, so I'm going to move on and talk about um, just some tools and resources right now. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly um, because these are more uh, tools that are used more commonly by pediatricians, but I just wanted to throw these out there because I think a lot of people have seen them, but just so that you understand why we use them and when we use them. Um, so rating scales for ADHD are extremely important, like I said, really for not only getting the initial symptoms, but following symptoms over time. The one that we most commonly use is the Vanderbilt, and the nice thing about the Vanderbilt is it's free. Um, so you can print it off online. Anybody can go online and look for it, and I'll show you where to find it in a second. It does follow the DSM-4 slash DSM-5 criteria, so it really goes through the 
those um, very easily. It's super easy to score. The negative about it is it's not normed. And what normed means, for those of you who don't know, is it means that they tested in a big population of kids and determined at each, each age what's typical and what's not typical and what's outside of the realm of quote unquote normal. And so in this case, that was never done. So it's kind of just a base, like does the child have the symptoms or don't they? Don't they or do they? And then it's up to the, the practitioner to really interpret it and decide how they want to use that information. There are also norm scales, and these are the ones that, like I said, have been tested in tons of people, and so they look at specific symptoms and say, if your symptom level is over this, you're at risk, or you, you know, you're clinically having issues with that. Um, and there's several of them, the Connors, the ADHD rating scale, and the Child um, Behavior Checklist. All of these, unfortunately, you have to pay for, so they tend to be a little bit more difficult, although a lot of them give more information, so sometimes they can be really nice to use. So this is what the Vanderbilt looks like, and most of the people in here have probably seen one of these because we use them a lot, but it's really easy to use. So the top nine are the uh, inattentive, the bottom nine are the hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. So simple, it divides it up. But the nice thing about the Vanderbilt is on the initial form, it also includes questions that ask about oppositional defiant disorder, which is one of the things we very frequently see in kids with ADHD. They also talk about conduct disorder, um, which again is kind of all this, the last set uh, and then finally, they talk about mood disorders depre like depression and anxiety as well. So it's nice because it not only goes into the ADHD symptoms, but it also expands out into a few additional things that we typically see. And again, like I said, it's free and you can, you can um, get it online. And then it also looks at the performance. So how is this actually affecting the child? Because it's important to know, um, is it affecting their school? But also, is it affecting their relationships? ADHD is not only a problem with attention and hyperactivity, but it really affects these kids' social functioning in a lot of different ways. And so it's important to keep an eye on those things and watch. Actually, let me show you. So this is actually the National Institute for Children's Health Quality put out a toolkit for pediatricians um, and clinicians in general. And it has all of this information, but it also has a lot of other really nice tools, including a lot of handouts um, for people with ADHD. And you can actually just download it um, from the NICHQ for free. This is one of the other things um, that is involved, in, included in that toolkit, and it's great for pediatricians to use. Unfortunately, it's not electronic um, to use on your computer, but you can actually print it off and use it. But I think it's also really nice for parents and educators and other people to be aware of so that they know what, what we should be thinking about. So it's just really systematic. It uses the Vanderbilt form to fill in kind of the diagnostic assessment, but it also asks about comorbidities and kind of history things that we should be asking for, and then it talks about the plan at the end. So although it can look a little bit cumbersome, it really, it's really nice because it's really a systematic way of looking at it. This is uh, an example of an ADHD management plan that also comes out of that particular toolkit. And again, I just think it's really nice to be able to give people a hard copy of what the plan is as a pediatrician, but also as a parent, if you look at this, you know, oh, I have to think about what's my plan to deal with this at home, and what's my plan at school, and what's my plan um, for medications, and what behavioral therapies. So I think it's just really nice to think about all the aspects that can be affected um, when you have ADHD. So this is an example. This is actually the second edition of that toolkit. This is available from the American Academy of Pediatrics website. It's less than $100, and it comes with a CD, and you can print off as many of the forms as you want. So it has not only the Vanderbilt and all the forms I just showed you, but several other forms and just handouts um, with basic information on ADHD. This is another place you can get it for free from the ADD Resource Center. Um, so both of those places, you literally just go and download it and print. The ADHD monitoring system is not very commonly used, but it can be really nice for teachers. And the reason I put it up here is because I think it's um, a, a tool that can be used for kind of regular follow-up um, in the classroom. If you have a child that you're really trying to follow their progression, uh, it can be really beneficial. Not only does it address the ADHD symptoms on the left, but on the right, it talks about whether there's a difference in their functioning in the morning or the afternoon or no difference. It talks about what percentage of the work are they getting done and how well they're doing the work. So it really is a little bit more specific when you're trying to think of how is this kid functioning in the classroom. So I do really like it for that aspect. Like I said, it's not really commonly used, but it is um, a really nice uh, monitoring system, and it's available for free. It's from Duke, but if you Google it, it's, you can find it for free. This is the ADHD medication guide, and I think this, is, this slide is more up there for providers who may be treating kids with ADHD. I love these guides. They update them extremely frequently. If you literally Google ADHD medication guide, these pop up. They usually update them every six months. 
Uh, they have all the newest medications for ADHD, and the great thing is that they talk about um, if you can, you know, if you have to swallow them, if you can open them, if they can be crushed, if they can be sprinkled, and it tells you kind of all the different ways that can be utilized, as well as the typical dosing and how often. Um, so I think it's such a huge resource for people when they're um, prescribing, but it can also be really nice for parents to remember, oh, what does that pill look like? I don't remember which one they're on. So sometimes it can be really nice to have those pictures as well. So I, I have one, I buy a new one whenever they come up with a new version and I keep it with me because it just helps me to keep track of all the things that are coming up and new. So parent resources. This is also obviously for me a really um, important uh, piece of information because I feel like if we can help parents understand their kids better, everybody's lives are, is, is really going to improve. The quality of life is going to be so much better. So um, the first thing that I strongly recommend is anyone who is um, kind of has questions about medication. So if you're considering starting your child on a medication or maybe your kid's already on medications but you're just not sure what to do with it or you have a lot of questions, this ADHD parent medication guide is outstanding. Um, it's actually from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry as well as the uh, American um, Psychiatric Association. It's got a, a ton of information about ADHD medications, why we use them, side effects, and different things to watch out for. So I strongly recommend it for anybody um, who has questions about medications. Um, the CHAD website. So I'm gonna, the rest of these are all gonna be online because I really feel like it's important to have um, kind of be able to find the information quickly. So CHAD is an outstanding website. It not only has information for parents and caregivers, but it also has information for providers um, that you can find different resources, handouts, and things like that. So I think it has really great information. They also have a local chapter um, that's a support, um, basically a support group that meets on Tuesday nights at the Mind Institute. And if you look it up, um, the Sacramento CHAD, you'll be able to find that. Um, and I actually go to that fairly often. These are some of the handouts that um, you can find online from the CHAD website. Some of them are available in Spanish, some of them aren't. Um, but a couple of the ones that I really like are ADHD sleep and sleep disorders. So I, I really like that one because it focuses on one of the issues that we frequently see in kids with ADHD. Uh, there's also uh, one that talks about parenting a child with ADHD, which I think has really nice information. And then the last one is college and ADHD, so I think everybody kind of, we, you know, there's another um, track on transition, but it's really important to uh, support these kids when they're going out into college because it can be really overwhelming and really difficult. Understood.org, um, I think probably many people um, have used understood.org or have heard of it, but understood.org is a, a really amazing website for kids, not only with attention issues, but also with learning disorders. Uh, and the reason I really like it is you can actually click and get personalized recommendations. So if you look at the purple um, where it says your parent toolkit, if you click through it, it actually allows you to pick out what things your child struggles with. And it also allows you to pick what conditions they have. So, you know, I just picked a couple of them. And then at the bottom it says what grades. So you're able to kind of find articles and information that's really focused on what you need. And so if you click on those things, then this, these are the articles um, and information that pops up based off of what I um, put in for my concerns. So I think that's really valuable. The other thing that I really love on the understood.org website is the through your child's eyes. And I don't know if anyone has ever seen this, but it's actually you can click on it and you can click on different disorders and it gives you the feeling of having that disorder while you're doing tasks. So a lot of them are typing tasks or answering questions and you have to go through it but it simulates what it would be like if you had dyslexia or if you had ADHD, what would it be like for a child? So that I think parents can really understand the difficulties that their kids face. Child, um, the Child Mind Institute is another really nice website. Uh, and the reason I like it is it has a lot of information for families, but it also has a whole section for educators, which I think is really nice. They cover a lot of different um, conditions. One of the things that I love is they have these guides, and there's parent guides and teacher guides to different um, problems and issues that can come up. One of them is ADHD, but I also like it because it attracts, um, it addresses some of the other disorders that may not be as commonly addressed. So it actually has a section on gender dysphoria. dysphoria. It has a section on um, selective mutism. So it has some sections that I think maybe a lot of websites don't necessarily cover as well. So I do really um, think it's a good resource. The ADDA um, is probably one of my favorite websites to recommend for older kids and adults. So the ADDA um, has been around for many, many years and they are really focused on adults. But 
they have a whole section for students, and I think it's outstanding because it addresses all of the things that can become an issue with ADHD that I think a lot of people don't think about. You know, we used to say, oh, well, they'll grow it, it's not a big deal, but it really does affect um, a lot of different aspects of adult life. So self-care and daily living, motivation, self-regulation, how to study, how to read, um, time management, and then also the big one that I think most people think about is the accommodation, so how do I get accommodations? But it also addresses all of those other pieces that I think are just forgotten so often. This is the um, Mind Institute website. So this is actually under um, the ADHD Research Center. So this has some basic information. The website, um, so one of the projects I've worked, at, worked on over the last couple years is actually developing a new ADHD website. So the new website is going to be put in in the not so distant future. We're finishing it up right now. Thanks to Patrick, who is our videographer today, who's also um, developing the website with me. Um, but the website was really constructed based off of feedback from families of kids with ADHD as well as adults with ADHD. So the goal was to make it as user friendly as possible and to include the, include the information that people really wanted. Um, and so that website will be coming up um, fairly quickly. These are kind of the topics that we cover, but the ones that really frequently came up for a lot of people that they had questions on was girls and women with ADHD, complementary and alternative um, treatment of ADHD, finding how do you know what is a reliable source for information when you're looking for information about ADHD, and also um, a list of local ADHD resources in the Sacramento area. So uh, like I said, that'll be coming out. We're going to be testing it fairly soon, and then we'll release it, uh, and it'll be attached to the Mind Institute website. So that'll be coming up soon. Just a few uh, more things I wanted to touch base on. Um, books for parents. There are a ton of ADHD books out there. Um, I put these on here just because they're the ones that I, I've read a lot of books on ADHD from um, in my personal life. And so these are kind of the ones that I found personally were the most helpful for me. Doesn't mean that there aren't really great other books that may be really helpful for you, but these are the ones that I really like um, from my own experience. So taking charge of ADHD is really just kind of a, kind of a really good overall um, view of ADHD, kind of teaching you about ADHD and also how to work with your child with ADHD. Um, your Defiant Child is one that focuses on really how to get your child um, to be less defiant and more compliant in, when you're asking them to do things. And I have a child who really had a lot of defiant behaviors early on and I had to learn how to work with that. This book was really helpful for me. The last one is Smart But Scattered and I really like this approach because it really looks at how do we help kids develop those executive skills and the specific skills that they may have more difficulty with. So instead of just saying these are all the problems you're going to run into and these are all the issues that you're going to have, this really says these are ways to build on the skills that you're having difficulty with and it really breaks it down. So I think it's a nice approach, um, especially for, for kind of the school age and a little bit older kids. There's actually oh, several versions of Smart But Scattered, so there's some for adolescents as well as adults, so there's several different versions but this is the kind of for the school age kids. These are a few of the books um, for different age ranges, and I think it's important to have kids feel comfortable um, with their ADHD, or even if they don't have ADHD, but they just have a lot of ADHD behaviors. So the top line is really for the younger kids, and probably one of my favorites um, is Mrs. Gorski. I think I have the Wiggle Fidgets, and my son loved that book when he was little. Um, there's also the, um, Baxter Turns Down His Buzz, and then I just don't like the sound of no, but they're all books that are really geared towards little kids, so you can help them understand a little bit better what's going on um, with them and so that they don't feel like they're alone. The bottom line is for older kids. So most people who work with um, kids with ADHD have heard of uh, putting on the brakes. So putting on the brakes is for older kids and they're able to read it and it really helps them understand the ADHD and learn some ways um, that they can kind of control uh, some of the difficulties that they're having. So I think that's a really, really nice book. The other three are actually like fiction books, but the reason that I put them up here is it's really important for kids with ADHD to have good self-esteem and to be able to identify with other people that are like them. These three uh, books, um, and actually a lot of the other ones, so Joey Pigza has a whole series, and this kid is a, is a little boy with ADHD who gets into trouble, but he's a really good kid, and he was really sweet, and he really means well, but he just gets himself into some bad situations. Um, but I think it's a really nice story um, because it really shows kids that there are other people like me and I, you know, I'm not a bad person. Sometimes I just do things that I shouldn't. Um, the ADHD attacks, The Monster Diary is like one of the graphic novels and a lot of those are like really hot nowadays. So the graphic novels are really popular. And then finally the Percy Jackson books. Almost all of Rick Riordan's books have like major characters that have ADHD, whether they're declared ADHD or just have a lot of ADHD symptoms. Almost all of the books have them. Um, and my son loves them because he's like, hey, I could be that kid. I could do that. See, I can do that. I have that. So I think it's just really nice to give kids 
some positive role models. They're not perfect, nobody's perfect, but to say it's okay to make mistakes, but do the best you can and work hard and you'll, you'll be fine and everyone, you know, everyone does okay in the end. So I think they're just really positive um, messages for kids. What about non-medical, like non-medications? What other recommendations? For behavior, yes. Yeah, so the non-medical treatments are really the behavioral treatments that I was talking about, so more of like the therapy, the parent interventions. So, so someone had asked about nutrition. What about exercise? So exercise is really great. So there is, a, um, thank you for asking that question. So there's definitely preliminary evidence that exercise does help kids with ADHD. Um, there's not a ton of it. There have been some studies that looked at general exercise. There have been um, some studies that looked at yoga and meditation in, in um, ADHD. Not very big studies. They're still pretty small and not really overwhelming results. Uh, but that being said, um, I think there's, that, that's starting to be studied more. Uh, but I, I definitely think that kids with ADHD, the majority of them really thrive when they have really regular regimented exercise routines. Um, and I tend to find a lot of my patients with ADHD gravitate towards um, swimming, uh, which really helps them regulate and they tend to have morning practices, which helps them regulate during the day, or other um, sporting teams where they um, can kind of work off their excess energy. But the evidence, there's not a lot of testing. And unfortunately, the sad thing is, when it comes to research, um, it's usually money driven and unfortunately there's not a lot of money in determining exercise. So sadly, it doesn't tend to get studied as strongly as medications. Uh, but I definitely think it's a huge, um, huge piece in, in taking care of kids with ADHD. Thank you. Should I just go? Whichever, oh, you have a mic? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I have a book to recommend for people who are interested in that. It's called Non-Drug Treatments for ADHD, written by two psychiatrists in New York. Patricia Gerbarg and Richard Brown. And it's very well researched and has a lot of clinical examples from their own patient population. And it covers everything, exercise, yoga, meditation, um, breathing, mindfulness, and um, diet, nutritional supplements, the whole realm of, and, and also oh, which medications are most likely to be effective for which people and in combination with what, it's really an excellent resource. Thank you. Non-drug treatments for ADHD. Whoever has a mic. Okay. Okay, so as a fellow mom, um, I'm suspicious that my daughter has ADHD. She's on the spectrum. What would you recommend tackling first as far as, like, extending her services at school? Because obviously the spectrum disorder is prevalent, but she has the attention span of a goldfish. So <laughs> we got to work on that. So... That's always a very individual um, decision, and it really depends on what's affecting her more. Uh, so if you're finding that she's having more difficulty really with the straight attention, then I would recommend really working on um, getting her treated for more of the attention issues. Um, it's, it's extremely variable. Some kids need more of the autism-based like ABA therapies, but I've had kids who are in therapy who literally they just couldn't pay attention long enough to function. Um, and for those kids, if they have all those ADHD symptoms, then very frequently they do really well with some medication to help them focus on the, the therapies that they're getting outside. But again, it's really hard to say in general because every child is really different. We just have time for one more. Okay. There was a hand over here. There you are. I knew you were. You can come up and ask. Don't worry. You can come up and grab me if you want to ask questions. Um, I have a question for um, children with ADHD. Um, do they need to have an IEP in the school in order to receive services? In my experience, my son came with a psychiatrist diagnosis for ADHD. We brought it to school. Uh, they made assessments on him, and he didn't get an IEP, just a 504, which limited to give him like a kind of cardboard so he didn't get distracted and break. So I'm surprised that there were resources. So how can we access to that? Um, so when it comes to IEPs versus 504s versus no plans, um, there is no necessarily like concrete way that all kids with ADHD will be addressed. Uh, a lot of kids with ADHD may not need many accommodations at all. So my son, the first several years in school, his teachers just helped him kind of figure things out and worked with him. As time got, got more advanced, we ended up needing a 504 and eventually an IEP just because of the, the demands that were placed on him. Uh, it really depends on how the ADHD is affecting his ability to function. One thing that I always point out to everybody is um, when it comes to getting services at a school, part of the education in a child 
in all children is that they sh the education doesn't only involve academics, it's also social. So if your child's ADHD, maybe they're doing really well in school and they're getting A's in the schools, like, hey, I'm not gonna touch that because he's doing great, but maybe socially or otherwise they're really struggling, that is grounds to get them extra help. Um, so it really just depends on how well he's doing and what help he needs. Many kids get by without needing a, a full IEP with ADHD. It just depends on how it affects um, kind of their overall functioning. So that's a really good question. So what she said is that if somebody had told her, a social worker had told her that if a child is on ADHD medication as a, as, as a, as a child, and then it, when they become an adult, that actually makes them more susceptible to addiction. The fact is, is there is a ton of research that is actually the opposite of that. So that is absolutely not the case. What we know is that when children are appropriately treated with medication or therapy for ADHD, they are less likely to use substances and abuse substances as they grow older. So that's definitely not true. That's a really great question because it's a myth that has been perpetuated all over the place. So I'm glad you brought that up. I, I can send it out later. I don't have it now. But there is a lot of research um, abuse. And actually, one of the um, mind staff um, Cassie Fassbender does uh, a lot of work with abuse, but it's, it's, we know that that is not the case. So yeah, and, it, and I, can, I can send some out later, and I can give you my information. But it's really, if they're appropriately treated, that is definitely not the case. Good question. Mm -hmm. So she asked um, about nutrition and treatment. If you look at, there's a lot of studies that look at different diets in ADHD. Um, none of them have showed really good evidence that any changes in diet improve ADHD symptoms. That being said, there are a few subsets. So if you look at children with celiac disease, which are diagnosed with celiac disease, not um, maybe just gluten sensitive, but have true celiac disease, those kids, if they're appropriately on a, a celiac free diet, do significantly improve. When you look at, there's a lot of um, restricting um, sugar, a lot of restricting um, additives and other things. There's not really any actual research that supports that, but I think all of us feel like, well, if you can have a healthier diet, I think that's what would be preferable, but there really isn't any um, really strong research that suggests there's specific diets that would be beneficial. But there are, is a very, there is a subgroup of kids that may benefit from some of them. So usually what I tell people is, I don't standardly recommend a restriction diet. That being said, it's okay to try one and you can see if something works. And if you find something that works for your child, that's great. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.